Welcome back to Fast Money. It was a big day for Bitcoin and Ether after the SEC said both cryptocurrencies are not securities. For more on what this means, let's get to Bob Bassani at the New York Stock Exchange for the details. Hey, Bob. Hello, Melissa. The SEC has been under mounting pressure to clarify if and under what circumstances cryptocurrencies and ICOs were securities and thus under the regulatory control of the SEC. Now, today, they went a long way toward providing clarity. Bill Hinman, the man in charge of developing the SEC's policy toward cryptocurrencies, said neither Bitcoin nor Ether were securities because they don't fit the definition of a security. An investment created if you are raising money from a centralized source for a project that people are investing in with the expectation of a profit. Now, regarding ICO. These are complex facts and circumstances tests, but when we look at Bitcoin or if we look at Ether and the highly decentralized nature of the networks, we don't see a third party promoter where applying the disclosure regime would make a lot of sense. So we're, we're comfortable uh, in some uh, sort of viewing these as uh, items that don't have to be regulated as securities. Now, regarding ICOs or initial coin offerings, Hinman said the SEC would apply the same test. And while many ICOs are clearly designed to make a profit, others, he said, are not. People are buying it for investment and for a return and looking to that party for a return, then again, that's an indicia of a security. If you have, on the other hand, a token that's just used in the network for a good or service, and that's why people are buying it, and that service is available and up and running, uh, not under development, then you may not have a security. Now, in our interviews, Hinman specifically said that an ICO that was a simple membership, for example, in a golf club or a book club, was likely not a security. Finally, Hinman defended the SEC's strict application of the securities laws, saying many ICOs had misrepresented investment opportunities and that some were outright, outright frauds. Melissa, we have had the head of the SEC on, the head of trading, and now the chief policymaker on Bitcoin. The SEC is clearly moving to clarify exactly what their positions are. A lot has happened in just the past couple of weeks. Bob, thank you. Bob Bassani okay. at the New York Stock Exchange. Going back to, I don't know where you want to start because there's so many things that are very important about what the SEC said yeah. today that clears the way for, let's say, Ether. Right. right. You have futures. So that's instance. what we, you know, the CBOE at the same conference said uh, today that this clears one of the hurdles for them to have uh, futures on Ethereum. Think about it the other way. If you're an investment director at a pension fund or an endowment, over the last year you thought about allocating to this space, and now, and the first thing you say is, well, you know what, what if this thing is really an unregistered security? Well, I better not invest in it. Now that hurdle's gone. So this is really big news. It's a green light for cryptocurrency. It's a green light for crypto assets as an asset class. There's some clarity. I mean, how many times have I stood up at the smart board this year and said, what's hurting Bitcoin? What's hurting Ether? Regulatory, uh, regulatory and clarity. We have clarity now. It's very clear when these are securities, when they're commodities. We also have clarity now on utility tokens, right, right. versus other sorts of ICOs. But the interesting thing about this, though, is we've talked to Asif Hirji many times um, of Coinbase about when he would list other coins. And the sticking point had always been whether or not these coins are securities mm -hmm. or not securities. Now that we have that clarity, if they do list utility tokens, are those worth the investment even? Well, it depends what, yeah, I mean, it depends if what the utility token is for, to be right? Used within that network. But then they, well, then but, they should be I mean, securities. No, not necessarily. I mean, it's like saying that if I buy a bottle of wine, right, should that be a security? Because I think that the bottle of wine is going to appreciate in price over the next couple of years? Not really. Well, my understanding, or though, is what, what they're saying is if the expectation is that I'm buying something that I think is going to go up in value, then, in fact, it's security. But if I'm buying something that's purely a utility, then it's not. But the no, it's, it's is a third party. Ninety five percent of these of, of the, the, the trading in, in, in ICOs is all for, for. I would think of it more to me. I look at it more as they go trading. from a security to a commodity, to similar commodity. to we speculate in oil, we speculate right. in gold. Right? right. And so if it's used primarily to operate the system and you don't have a third party that you're relying on to make money, that is simply a speculation, then that is more like a commodity than it is a security. What does that mean for like an XRP? An XRP, from the way I understand yeah. it, it's a technology solution that you don't necessarily need to use the coin to transact on the platform. So what happens to an XRP? How does a ripple? So yeah, XRP, I think, is still in, in limbo here. And there is a case on XRP right. on whether or not it's going to be a security. And I think we're going to have to wait for that. Case. Yeah, yeah, a lawsuit. lawsuit. I'm sorry. Yeah. A lawsuit on whether or not 
XRP is a security. I think for that particular coin, we're going to have to wait on it because there's a relationship between Ripple the coin and ripple the company. We can argue about what, how, what, how close that is, but that's the sticking point. Is there any trade in your view in terms of some of the coins that are there that were struggling in regulatory limbo and may now be considered commodities and so then may yeah. be listed on Coinbase and may get that pop? I mean, the easiest is Ethereum, right? That's what's been overhanging this entire thing is, was Ethereum a security? Very clearly said it's not a security. Yeah. So that to me the is the best there. one. Um, our next guest used to manage over $7 billion at Goldman Sachs before leaving to start a passive crypto index fund. Christopher Matta is a co-founder of Crescent Crypto Asset Management. He joins us for his Fast Money debut. Chris, welcome to the show. Great Thanks to have you with us. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. Um, you left when? Last year? Last fall. Last fall. So it was yep. just before the huge run-up. Yeah, exactly. So at the time, uh, the space was really starting to grow. Uh, it went from being uh, a personal hobby to being a full-time focus. Um, and at the time, there weren't really any passive players in the space. There were a handful of active managers charging 2 and 20 or 3 and 30, very high fees. And we had demand just in our own networks being known as the crypto guys. Um, at Goldman. At, yeah. at Goldman. We had demand from colleagues, friends, mm -hmm. uh, and other people in our network for a really complexity-free product that they wanted to get diversified exposure to the space. So it was kind of the perfect timing. Is there diversified exposure to this space since so many of them are correlated? Yeah, so there's there's various levels of correlation between these coins, but holding a basket of, of 20 versus just holding Bitcoin, you're going to get better absolute and risk adjusted returns in a, because of that diversification benefit that you get. So even though it's it, each coin may be incremental, it's still better than holding just something like Bitcoin. Your drawdowns will be less, less volatility. Um, withholding a diversified basket. How important was the SEC and what they decided today when it comes to uh, Ether, when it comes to utility tokens, to what you do? And when you take a look at the 10% pop in Ether or the 6% pop in Bitcoin on the news, do you think, I would think that the cryptos would be up even more based on that? Yeah, I think people generally had a sense of what the feeling was with Ethereum. I think there was some still murkiness around that. Um, so I, I think we've been in kind of this regulatory, this regulatory uncertainty for six months now. And this is just one piece of a broader picture, right? There's still the custodian question. There's still uh, questions around exchange traded products, which really need to be answered before uh, more institutions feel more comfortable and get into the space in an, in an easier way. And exchange traded products are something that we're really focused on as, as a big catalyst in the space over the next year or two. Hey, Chris, so you have this basket of 20 currencies. How do you decide what to put in that basket? Is it simply just market cap weighted? Yeah. And over the, do you see that changing over time? Yeah, we wanted to create something that was future proof. So there is a market cap weight, but it's a 90 day average to really smooth the volatility. You see some of these coins explode in value and jump into the top 20. They really need to sustain that value to be to prove themselves, I guess, as a, as a real true investment. So it needs to meet that threshold to stay in the portfolio. We also have controls around liquidity measures. It has to meet certain thresholds and be available on multiple exchanges that are available here in the United States. And actually custody is a, is a big piece for us. We, we won't hold a coin that you can't hold in cold storage. So, uh, you know, funds, we want to make sure that, that people are able to store these in the safest way. As you constantly hear about these exchange hacks, uh, we don't want our clients or, or the index to really be taking that risk. So you started uh, your fund in the fall, and you saw the huge run-up, and times are great. Everybody wanted in, and then you saw the big decline. Have you yeah. seen people want out? And how has that been managing investors? I mean, everybody wanted to start a crypto fund, and now it's like, who wants to start a crypto <laughs> fund? Yeah, absolutely. There's definitely been, thankfully, we do a lot of education up front, I think is a big piece. We explain to people this is a really long-term investment. It's, we're looking at a two- to five-year-plus time horizon. And I don't think the bull thesis has changed at all. You know, you saw a lot of volatility, but uh, there was a bit of a mania at the end of last year, and now the regulators have started to step in. But I think long term, their, their tune has been pretty bullish. Uh, so our clients thankfully understand that. We told them when they were coming in, you know, this could be down 50% tomorrow. It could be up 300% next week. You, you have to hold this for, for a longer term. And, and people that understand that allocate appropriately in their overall portfolio to this asset class, understand that and, and will ultimately do well.
So you left, and, and that was just about the time that Goldman had indicated that it would start its own crypto trading desk. Yeah. So I'm wondering what, what the thought process is in terms of staying within a big firm, because it seems like more and more big firms are, are looking at this path, and so people at the firms might be thinking, oh, do I stay here to be in crypto, or do I go out on my own? Yeah, I think there's been a lot of opportunity uh, to start your own your own business and launch your own fund or, you know, like you said, you, you kind of saw an explosion of funds last year. And I think that's toned down a little with the pullback in the market. Um, I think it's going to be a little longer before there's a lot of crypto positions available at a place like Goldman, right? That desk is, is kind of just starting. Uh, I don't think they're hiring hundreds of people. They're hiring a few select people for that. So I think you're still going to see entrepreneurs going into the space, trying to take advantage of the opportunities. Right. And seeing what crypto has done, experiencing it, um, in a front row seat, yeah. Chris, would you put your mother's, would you put your grandmother's money into the funds that you have? Yeah, absolutely. And it's all really? about sizing appropriately. So even if you're the most conservative investor out there, right, just because there's a lot of volatility, the actual risk adjusted returns are, are quite good relative to other asset classes. So for my grandma, I might put in half a percent of her portfolio. That's her downside is half a percent, but her upside you might get 10x, uh, you know, over the next five years. And that would be a great diversifier for her portfolio in general and, and a, a good investment overall. It's, it's generally been uncorrelated, and that will probably continue for a little while. Um, and that's, that has huge diversification benefits in a broader portfolio, even if sized in a small way. Do you have a grandma in crypto? Uh, <laughs> I don't have a grandma okay. in crypto. Okay. Parents. Parents in crypto. Parents. Parents in okay, crypto. very good. Chris, thank you. Thank you. Chris Matta. I went to high school as his grandmother. Okay. <laughs> really? So he's like nine Wait. years old. Look at him. He's fantastic. <laughs> kidding around. I'm kidding around. Little old lady from Pasadena. So, so what's interesting about what Chris is talking about? He's getting also into fund structure. And you know, as a, as a former hedge fund guy, you know, the, the question ultimately comes down to liquidity and and what is a lockup. And and we're talking about assets that at times have no liquidity. And so our fund managers locking people up, Brian. I mean, what, you know, what's no, the story here? Uh, listen, liquidity's gotten a lot world's better. world's changed so much. And, yeah, I mean, it's, it's changed a lot. I mean, what we do, what I do every day is I monitor what our positions are, how much liquidity is there, and I will cap the fund size depending on what the market's right. doing. Liquidity has improved a lot over the last six months, but to your point, you know, there are, if, if you get too big of a position in an illiquid coin, it can be an issue. I mean, you know, Chris's point about, you know, let's say a half percent, one to five percent allocated to this... Uh, asset class, I think, is appropriate. It's highly risky. It's like it's similar to liquid venture capital, so you have to understand the risks. But it's also an emerging asset class, so there's a lot of return possible. I'll ask you the same question: Do yeah. you have a grandma in your ETF? Uh, do I have or, a grandma? Uh, I'm sure I have grandmas in the ETF. No, no, but yeah, I mean, like in, in your the own fund? family. I'm yeah, just and, uh, well, we have family for sure. Yeah. Um, yes, in fact, we do. We do have a grandma. Okay. My right. my, my mother's a grandmother. I, guess, I thought so. it'd be fair and ask yeah. the same. Question. Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs and the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. About the only thing you can't do is ignore them because they change things. They push the human race forward. And while some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do.